Okay, so moving on after we've talked a little bit about how we vasodilate and vasoconstrict and what uh, catecholamine and the ner and what system is working when during constriction and dilation, um, we're going to move on to now oxygen consumption. So what is VO2? So VO2 is oxygen consumption. That is cardiac output times a VO2 difference. That is the equation. So we have a delivery component and an extraction component. Our delivery component is the cardiac output, which is our heart rate times our stroke volume. That's we're bringing blood to the working area. Our extraction component is at the level of the tissues, which is our AVO2 difference. What is AVO2 difference? So AVO2 difference increases with exercise, okay? At rest, skeletal muscle receives about 20 mils of O2 per 100 mils on the arterial side. At rest, skeletal muscles may only extract about 5 mLs of O2, and the venous side will then have about 15 mLs of O2 if we were to measure. With exercise, the meta metabolically active skeletal muscles will extract more O2 and widen their AVO2 difference. So the AVO2 difference can increase up to 16 mLs of oxygen, which represents oxygen uptake at the tissue level. So our AVO2 difference is representing how much oxygen is dropped off at the tissue level. That's what AVO2 difference is. What's the difference of oxygen on the arterial side compared to the venous side? And that's going to give you your AVO2 difference. So if we had, if we measured our oxygen levels on the arterial side and it was 20 mLs and then we measured again on the venous side and we had 15 mLs on the venous side of O2 that means we only extracted 5 mLs of oxygen at the tissue level but what I'm saying here is during exercise we extract a lot more oxygen during exercise so we widen that AVO2 difference is what we call it so if we have let's so say the same 20 mLs coming into the tissues on the arterial side, then we measure on the venous side, and let's say we only have four mLs of oxygen on the venous side returning back to the heart. That means the t level at the tissues extracted about 16 mLs of oxygen. So it represents what's dropped off at the tissue level. Okay, so let's talk more about oxygen consumption. Oxygen consumption is, repre is re which is represented in liters per minute is considered in absolute terms. Anytime it is represented as mLs per kg per minute, we are referencing it in relative terms, right? So we talked about absolute strength and relative strength, right? So absolute is the exact number we were, we were able to lift the weight. Like I could lift 50 pounds, that's my absolute term. But if you can put it in comparison to someone's body weight, you put it into relative terms. And that's where we had no difference in male or female once we took body weight and body mass into consideration. So it's the same thing here. If we see an if we see oxygen consumption represented in liters per minute, that's an absolute terms. But anytime we are representing it as an mLs per kg per minute, we are making it relative to that person in their size. Okay. So a sedentary person, and of course that's going to then compare and uh, from kilogram to kilogram. So that allows us to compare. The relative aspect here allows us to compare person to person because we are taking body mass or kilograms into consideration. A sedentary person is going to consume about 30 mLs of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute when they begin to exercise, about 30 mLs. They will also exercise at a low intensity and they will hit that number fairly quickly. Okay, so when we talk about hemodynamics, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about plasma volume and fluid shifts. So at the onset of exercise, there will be an, an ish, initial increase in plasma volume thought to be a protective mechanism so that the blood does not become too hemoconcentrated too quickly. So we'll have an initial increase in blood volume. It's thought to be a protective mechanism. As a, as a person continues to exercise, he or she will lose plasma volume due to sweating. Fluid shifts will occur from the intravascular space to the extravascular space. This is caused by an increase in intracapillary hydrostatic pressure within the capillaries, which favors filtration 
out of the intravascular compartment and into the extravascular compartment. As plasma volume decreases, the viscosity of blood increases. And we've talked about that already, but we're going to relate that back to a myocardial strain. Okay, so here we have a vessel. We are not going to go over all of the different pressures for filtration and absorption um, during, during this class. It's a little bit um, outside the scope of the class, but I want you to understand um, what occurs and, and why these fluid shifts are occurring. So we will have fluid from the intravascular space to the extravascular space. This is caused by an increase in intracapillary hydrostatic pressure within the capillary, so within the capillaries itself, which favors filtration out, okay, out of the vessel in the in, of the intravascular compartment and into the extravascular compartment. So as plasma volume is decreasing, so this is where the blood flow is, and we are pushing fluid out of there, what's going to happen to this blood right here as we filter more water or fluid out? That blood is going to become a lot more viscous in these in these um, vessels right here. That makes sense, right? Because we're sweating and we are trying to cool ourselves. We have to evaporate that sweat because we are trying to decrease temperature. So what's another problem is we increase blood viscosity. Do that, but an increase in intracapillary hydrostatic pressure of the of this capillary is favors filtration of fluid out of the capillaries and therefore increases the viscosity. That's what I want you to know. All right, so as we increase blood viscosity, right, this is going to create a myocardial strain when exercising, and the heart now has to pump a thicker fluid through the vessels. So the viscosity of blood is increasing as we lose plasma volume, right, because we're sweating and then we need to evaporate that sweat in order for us to cool down. But as we're losing plasma volume, we're increasing viscosity, and that now our blood is a lot thicker. So our heart has to work 10 times harder in order to pump blood, that thickened blood, into the working tissues. But if we want to keep exercising, we have to increase, increase our heart rate, right, our cycle rate. So that creates what's called a myocardial strain. And the most costly activity a heart can do is generate tension. So if we generate tension more times per minute, so that it means heart rate, so cycles per minute, the more time we have to generate tension, that creates a myocardial strain. So that's why we want a decreased heart rate at rest or even during exercise, we want a lower exercising heart rate due to training because then we are putting less strain on the heart. So the most costly activity the heart can do is actually generate tension. So we want to do that less times per minute. So that's why we want a lower heart rate. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about nitric oxide, which is considered a vasoactive substance. So nitric oxide is a vasoactive substance which can impact upon the luminal size of the vessel as well. So as we exercise and we lose plasma volume, like we just talked about, the blood becomes more viscous. An increase in viscosity increasing increases the shear stress placed upon the vessel as it's moving through. Right here, right, shear stress. Shear stress is the energy lost due to internal resistance. This energy lost will be in the form of pressure. Remember, go back to the first bioenergetics and our gradients. Pressure is an energy form. So the energy which is lost here based on, because of shear stress will be in the form of pressure. Because the amount of pressure at one end of the vessel will be different than the amount of pressure at the opposite end. The greater that drop is, the greater resistance that tube offers. All right, so that makes sense. If we took pressure at one end of the tube and then the pressure at the other end of the tube, the greater that drop from the beginning of the tube to the end of the tube shows just how much resistance that vessel is offering to that fluid going through. So a greater drop of pressure means there's a greater amount of resistance going through the tube and that all relates back to shear stress so which is energy lost to internal resistance so that's what that's what that term means okay so what is shear rate so let's talk about the fluid that is going through the capillary right now or the vessel right now or through the arterial shear rate 
is the relative velocity of the adjacent fluid layers. So how fast is this fluid going through the vessel? Pretty much, right? Okay, as we become more viscous, shear rate decreases. That makes sense. So it's the velocity of the adjacent fluid layers. So as viscosity increases, shear rate decreases, right? So the velocity is going to decrease the thicker our fluid is. The blood will have a tendency that is going through the vessel to want to pull on the endo endothelial lining with it. This is called viscous drag. So, right, so as this thickened blood is coming through this vessel, it, it kind of wants to attach and grab onto this endothelial lining and it almost wants to pull it with it. And that term is called viscous drag. So that shear stress placed upon the vessel will impact upon some vasoactive substances which are in the endothelial lining, right? So that shear stress, that energy loss to internal resistance, which is placed on these vessels here, will impact on some vasoactive substances which are in the, in the endothelial lining themselves. So they're here. They're not up in the brain. They're not, you know, being released there to send through sympathetic nervous system or catecholamines. We have something called nitric oxide, which is in these endothelial lining itself. So nitric oxide will be released from the endothelium, which will then act directly upon the smooth muscle cells that are surrounding the arteriole and cause relaxation thereby decreasing resistance and increasing the flow of blood to the area as well. So I'll say that again. So as we increase in shear stress, right, shear rate decreases because vol the viscosity is increasing with fluid due to the loss of, of plasma volume. That increase in viscosity of the fluid wants the tendency to pull that endothelial lining with it. Okay, and that's called viscous drag, right? It makes sense if we have a viscous fluid, it wants to drag that endothelial lining with it. That dr viscous drag, that will, that pulling on the endothelial lining will activate nitric oxide from the endothelium. Those will act directly upon the smooth muscle cells that are surrounding the arterial and cause them to relax, thereby decreasing the resistance and increasing flow to the area. So we will have some dilation as well. So we are bringing more blood to the area and therefore decreasing that shear stress that's being placed upon the vessel. Another way we vasodilate during exercise. <clears throat> so we talked about the presser and depressor areas, right? The presser is going to vasoconstrict in certain areas and then our depressor area is going to tell the presser center to back off on its discharge the epinephrine will attach to those beta-2 receptors and we will have passive vasodilation. But also, secondly, we to help us vasodilate, we have that nitric oxide that's in the endothelium that will also directly impact upon smooth muscle tissues. And those will the tissues will then vasodilate and bring more blood flow to the area and they will relax. Okay, so let's talk a few a few bullet points about chronic training adaptation. So if we are chronically training, what adaptations do we see in our cardiovascular system in the periphery? In the heart, absolute myocyte size, myocyte size increases, therefore aiding in the hypertrophy of the myocardium. More muscle mass has the ability to generate more force and therefore a greater stroke volume. We talked about that last lecture. Vagal tone is also increased, and therefore heart rate will be lowered at a resting standpoint, right? So that's why more trained individuals have a lower resting heart rate, because of the increase of vagal tone. This is beneficial to us because of what I said before, because the most costly activity the heart can engage in is generating force. So now the heart has to do this less times per minute is a benefit to us. That's what we want. A lowered heart rate also allows for more time in diastole and cardiac filling time. That, along with the ability to generate more force due to the increase in muscle mass of the heart, will increase stroke volume with each cycle. Capillary density at the skeletal muscles also improves. This enhances our diffusible surface area while decreasing diffusible distance, so therefore the uptake of O2 is enhanced as well. Trained individuals also have a 
larger circulating blood volume. So trained individuals also have a larger circulating blood volume as well.